Okay, um, welcome everybody to our webinar today. Um, my name is Sarah. Um, I coordinate informative webinars for Myers clients and HSC professionals. And um, before I introduce Andy, I'm just going to go through some of the uh, webinar software in front of you. There's a Q&A panel at the bottom. Um, now, if you can type your questions in there, we will endeavor to answer all, if not most of them at the end. I'll be asking Andy some of those questions. So feel free to type them in during the session. Um, there is also a chat channel. If you want to ask myself a, a technical correct, a, question you can do that through there but direct it just to me um, and um, and that should be uh, everything you should be fine with that uh, uh, following the re record uh, the webinar we are we are recording the video so we're going to produce a video and we'll share that but that could be a day or so later and we'll also email you some contacts for some questions if you want to ask Andy or Bureau Veritas questions after the event so um, without any ado, um, I'll just um, tell you a little bit about Andy. He has, um, Andy Holmes, he's with Bureau Veritas. He has 12 years experience in manufacturing, um, including the technologically challenging world of nuclear fuel. He has over 20 years experience in management systems and auditing and over 10 years as a senior manager in that industry. In addition to auditing in many different industries and against different management system standards, he has extensive experience in selecting, training, qualifying and coaching auditors in food safety, quality, environment and safety systems. He's extensive experience in auditing management systems in many different industries, including chemicals, mining, fabrications, food and professional services. Um, including consulting, engineering, and research and development. He's very experienced in training and qualifying auditors in different disciplines, including quality, environment, and safety. He has developed and de delivered training programs to assist organizations to develop and implement management systems. And he has extensive experience in managing business operations as part of a multinational operation. So over to you, Andy, and very thank you. We appreciate you joining us today. Blimey, thank you for the build-up, Sarah, and uh, good, good morning to everyone over there. Um, it's going to be another hot one in Perth, so I, I hope you're all keeping as cool as you possibly can. Uh, yeah, 45,001, is it worth the wait? Well, you guys will have to be the judge of that when you get your hands on it and start, start to get to grips with it. This session we're running today is very much a, a quick and dirty overview of the changes to 45,001 that they reflect my opinion based on what I've read, uh, what I think the impact of these, this new standard will be on safety management systems I've come in contact with. Um, but this session and my opinions will not replace the fact that you guys will have to read the standard and apply it yourselves in your own environment if you're going to take it up. So let's get on with the, um, the session. Um, most of you will probably have management systems already in place, probably a combination of OSAS 18001 and or AS 4801. Um, for my purposes, for certification purposes, we tend to regard 18,001 as very similar to 4801. So I, I, I'm not going to differentiate between the two in, in this session. So what's different with 45,001? So in broad terms, the the standards aligned with all the other ISO standards that management system standards have been written with the standard 10 clauses. Those of you who've got ISO 9001 or 14001 experience will know what I'm talking about. Um, there are some additional definitions that 45001 contains and I'll show you those in a minute. And there's new requirements related to system design considerations. So thinking about context of the organization, interested parties, risks and opportunities and top management involvement. So they are quite new requirements that are inferred with the existing standards. 
but they've never actually been specified in writing. Um, and then there's incorporation of good safety management system practice that's been picked up through experience of operating 18,001 and 4801. So the, the, the 10 clause structure of 45,001 reflects the common structure of the other management system standards around and revolving around the idea of internal external issues um, and the top left of that picture uh, linking into needs and expectations of interested parties at the top right and that then gets linked into the planning process for risks and opportunities and those are managed through support and operation activities into performance uh, actually managing the operation itself there's performance evaluation to evaluate how well the operation is working and then improvement processes at clause 10 to improve where needed the idea of the diagram ladies and gentlemen is to try and show that clause 5 sits in the middle clause 5 is leadership from top management and worker participation the the significance of that to me is that clause 5 especially top management involvement acts like the axle of a wheel uh, everything revolves around top management involvement and leadership uh, and we all as engineers we know what happens if an axle fails things fly apart pretty quickly so i think the the diagram tries to show the importance of clause five and getting top management involvement in a, a management system so this, this slide just shows uh, in the drafting of one, uh, it shows in blue the common text that it, that forty five thousand one shares with nine thousand one and fourteen thousand one, and then you'll see in black the the bits that have been changed to make it OHS focused. So that demonstrates the. Uh, the drive that the ISO organization put into trying to standardize across these management system standards as much as they possibly can with common wording and common structure. So a few definitions that have been appearing 45,001 that don't appear or uh, have little exposure in other standards. So, there's a worker who performs work or work-related activities. Now that definition is probably different to what we all understand from WHS regulations and things, but it works for 45,001. The idea of participation, it's involving workers in decision-making processes. Consultation, seeks the views of workers before making a decision rather than telling them what you've decided afterwards. A requirement is a need or expectation that's stated, generally implied or obligatory. So requirements appear quite often in 45,001. Key definition, um, top management, and it's the same in UMS and EMS. It's a personal group of people directing and controlling an organization at the highest level. Uh, and there's quite a lot of requirements for top management, as you'll see later on. The management system has to be effective. And the definition of effectiveness is the extent to which planned activities are realized and planned results achieved. So there's a great focus on planning the system working out what needs to be controlled putting control measures in place but then evaluating the effectiveness of it one of the things that 45001 does which is different to previous standards it brings in the requirement to identify ohs opportunities as well as risks now most of us who've been dealing with safety understand the idea of risk as potential to cause harm 
45,000 one says, yeah, you, you're still looking at risks that can cause harm, but you're also looking for opportunities where you can actually improve performance. And then you, the standard requires these opportunities to be managed to realize their full potential. And then there's the, the same definition of outsource used in, in the other standards. It's where an external organization performs part of an or, or all of an organization's functional process. And there's some requirements for managing outsourced activities. So 45,000, you'll have to understand how those apply to your organization and the context you're in. Thankfully, with this release of 45,001, there's a lot of requirements that you'll know and recognize from other management system standards for safety. So pretty much an OHS management system has some basic processes in it. Any, any system has got to identify hazards, evaluate risks, take risk reduction measures, and put controls in place to manage the residual risk. Likewise, an organization has to have processes for identifying its legal obligations, planning to achieve them, and evaluating how well it's achieved them. And then there's the supporting processes of um, monitoring and measuring performance improving and investigating issues uh, incidents there's processes for making sure people are competent and licensed and qualified to do the activities there's a requirement to consult to communicate and manage documented information so all those are standard basic processes that any ohs management system will have to have and likewise, 45,001 has it all. It's just added a few more bits on top to, uh, to give further focus perhaps to the management system. So what's new? So these front end clauses, clause four, uh, context, Understanding needs and, and expectations of workers and interested parties, clause 4.2. And then feeding that into clause six, actions to address risks and opportunities. So those are the key new requirements. And then if you read through it, you'll find that there's a, a lot of requirements from 18,001 and 4801 that have been bandied together and put under a perhaps a different heading but you'll recognize the requirements when you read it so leadership and commitment is um, enhanced uh, there's a requirement to manage manage change which is implied in the other standards but it's now under its own clause uh, procurement management of contractors and outsourcing have all been strengthened and pulled together into one requirement and continual improvement. So in my simple diagrammatic fashion, um, I've identified here the key clauses that have changed. And uh, what I'm gonna do is just whiz through some of these clauses that have, that significantly change and have a look at how they work. So kick off at the front, so clause four. Clause four talks about context of the organization. And the standard talk about the internal and external context that the organization is working in. So the internal context is made up of issues to do with culture. So culture related to safety. Some organizations have a very strong safety culture. 
others are perhaps a little more um, take it by chance rather than planning and putting energy into it. Uh, some organisations have a very, very high value for safety performance, safety culture and safety behaviour and others are a little more um, less focused on that. Some organisations have an excellent performance of managing safety. They're very rigorous in what they do and they make sure that they're, they're working on reducing near misses and things like that. Other organisations, they may not be monitoring their performance as well as they should be and that, that's an area for improvement. So the organisation has to look at its internal context and work out what are its strengths and weaknesses. And then it looks at the external context. What's the environment and business area and customers that the business is servicing? And it takes into account uh, political changes that are going on. Uh, changes in government can ch lead to changes in policy relating to safety matters. And for some organisations, that can be quite significant. There can be economic uh, issues going on where changes in economic levels of activity may impact the organisation's profitability, its ability to, to spend money on capital projects, which may reduce its ability to get rid of safety issues and things. Uh, social expectations, what does society expect from this organisation, technological changes that are relevant and legal obligations that might change. So this is one of the new areas of 45,001 that caused quite a bit of a stir with 9,001 and 14,001 when it was introduced. But it, essentially uh, organisations have tackled this by Take doing a, a SWOT analysis where the strengths and weaknesses aspect is looking at the internal context. Opportunities and threats tends to look at external context. And this SWOT analysis is done in relation to safety issues as opposed to a SWOT analysis for 9001, which looks at quality issues. So that's a, it seems to be a fairly widely used technique for the other standards, 9001, 14001, it can be applied to OHS as well. So the other bit of context is expectations of workers and other in interested parties. Now, the, the other management system standards have been around like OSAS and 4801. Um, to apply a management system standard in a realistic way requires an understanding of, well, who are the interested parties and what, what are they interested in us for, for, for safety purposes. So it's implied in the other standards, but for 45,001, they, they've said, let's not imply it, let's make sure it's written in black and white. So the requirements are to look at Okay, so who are all the interested parties and what might their expectations be? So generally speaking, uh, most organisations know what these are, but they may not have formally worked through them in a structured way to make sure that they do actually properly think through what are all the expectations of these interested parties and make sure that they've, they've covered off their expectations. So it's a 45,000 ones bringing in a, a structured, disciplined approach to something that might have been a little bit more haphazard in the past with the other standards. So having done the context, internal external context and interested parties, the next so I've tried to represent that in this diagram 
by saying, well, okay, um, a lot of you have got an existing management system in place. So whether it's 18,001 or 4801, on the right-hand side of the diagram, you've got your existing safety management system and you, you, you're familiar with the plan, do, check, act cycle and that's all happening away. So to address clause six, 6.1 risks and opportunities, uh, what you're going to do is focus less on the operational safety risks, the day-to-day -day safety risks, and start looking at what are the strategic risks that the organization is going to face based on its internal, external context and interested parties, and make sure that where there's a, a risk that things could go wrong and cause problems, they're addressed and also any opportunities that might be seen from this uh, analysis of context and interested parties those opportunities are identified and they're addressed as well uh, one of the interested parties is obviously going to be regulators and so one of the interested parties there will pick up clause 6.1.3 where you, you're starting to identify your legal obligations and that feeds into the strategic risks. From those risks and opportunities you take the, the um, direction to set some objectives and targets for addressing some of these risks and opportunities and then planning action plans to roll them out and implement them effectively such that the risks are properly managed to reduce their impact and opportunities are managed to, to make sure you maximize the benefit from the opportunity. So the, the organization opportunities and then takes in that brings us into hazard identification and risk assessment. And this is all standard run of the mill hazard and risk assessment process that you'll all be familiar with. So having identified risk and opportunities at the strategic level with that previous slide, clause 6.1 goes on to say, yeah, so now you're looking at your operational risk hazards and risks and making sure they're under control. Um, it just clarifies the fact that, yes, they want, um, they want some clearer hazard identification guidance uh, and making sure that any opportunities to improve are managed through. It's all in, if you've been in implementing and applying 18,001 and 4801 in a realistic way, you'll have covered off these additional hazard identification guidance that 45,001 carries. Planning to take action includes uh, a plan. So your plans cover plans to address risks that you'll can address legal requirements and emergency situations and plan how to integrate implement them and evaluate the effectiveness of the actions so there's there's a clearer requirement here is plan what you're going to do which you'll all be familiar with from 18001 but planning to integrate and make sure these actions are bedded into the management system and evaluate how effective they've been. There is a, a great temptation to plan actions, take actions and hope that they're okay, but this is about evaluating the effectiveness of them. So, you pretty much know that uh, setting OHS, OHS objectives, they uh, have to be 
measurable. Um, so the uh, the objectives are required to take into account the outcomes of consultation processes, the outcomes of risk assessments, and the outcomes of legal obligations analysis. So the expectation is that an organization that has got significant risks and has got significant legal obligations is likely to have set some OHS measurable objectives on ensuring these things are addressed properly or improving the level of compliance or something like that. And the organization has to plan uh, who does what and when and how and the method of evaluation to achieve these objectives. So this is specified rather clearer. Um, top man required to demonstrate leadership and commitment. Now, there's always been an expectation of management involvement. Uh, uh, but the way 45,000 runs it is to say, rather than hoping top management get the idea of what they're supposed to be doing, rather than implying it in a standard and hoping they do it, they've taken the step of saying, nah, we're going to write a specification for top management so that there's no argument. It lays out exactly what they have to do. So. 5.1 talks about top management. And remember, this is the definition of top management is the personal group of people who control and direct an organization at the most senior level. So they have to ensure policy and objectives are established. Yeah, you've probably got those already. Ensure integration of the safety of the occupational health and safety system into business processes. So hopefully safety management isn't an add-on it's it's integrated into the way the the organization does business um policy and objectives are aligned with strategic direction um the objectives that are set for the safety management system should be driven by the context analysis of the organization ensure the active participation of workers now that that can be a problem in some organizations and in some environments. Uh, but top management are responsible for ensuring that there is active participation of workers in consultation and communication. Ensure the management system achieves intended outcomes. Um, sometimes it's a bit tricky when I've interviewed top management to say, well, what are the intended outcomes of your management system? Um, some of the cynical replies are certification. But the 45,001 and the other standards are now laying down the fact that top management have to ensure that the intended outcomes of the safety management system are being achieved. So it's worth uh, you guys talking to your senior management before you go for 45,001. Make sure they actually know what the outcomes of the OHS is supposed to be. Um, taking action on risk, non conformities, and opportunities. Yeah, N not just crossing the fingers and hoping it actions taken. They need to manage those actions to make sure they're being done. Promoting a culture of supporting OHS. And with all standards now, there is no management system representative anymore because top management are now responsible for the effectiveness of the management system, not the management system representative. Um, participation, this has been strengthened a bit to where clause 5.4 requires the organization to emphasize consultation of non-managerial workers in these mechanisms. Um, so 
Yeah, it's 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 top management trying to get active participation of non-managerial workers. Um, some organisations do it well, some don't. Forty-five thousand one says that nah, top management have to really work hard to try and get non-managerial workers involvement. And there's emphasising the participation of non-managerial workers in developing these interested parties expectations, policy roles and responsibilities. So if an organisation has got a, a really active uh, safety committee, uh, things like that, hopefully this has been addressed. For organisations that don't have that sort of activity, um, they'll have to work hard to try and address how this would happen in their situation. Um, clause seven talks about support. Um, those of you who've got 9,000 or 14,000 will know about uh, putting in place infrastructure, resources. You'll understand the idea of competency. Uh, those are broadly the same as 18,001 has is already. Um, 7.3 talks about awareness and yeah, workers and other people have to be aware of implications and not following procedures, results of incident investigations, hazards and risks and ability to remove themselves from imminent danger. So there's a, a clarification there of what awareness means to people who are actually working in the organisation. So, information and communication, the organisation has to determine its communication needs, what needs to be communicated, when, to whom and how. Um, this is this is quite often addressed now with uh, communication matrices, if you like, where you've got listings of various levels of authority within the organisation and what they're responsible for communicating and to whom uh, in, in a fairly simple matrix. Um, documented information or controlled documents, if you like. Uh, they are to be appropriate to the organisation. It's the same as, as you already got in place. There's, there's no significant differences there. Um, clause eight for operations. Um, yeah, the organisational plan and control its activities. Absolutely. It'll apply the hierarchy of control. Of course it will. It'll manage change in the workplace in a planned manner, naturally. And the organization will manage its contractors where those contractors are exposed to hazards and risks, either to themselves or to the organization. So 45,001 starts to, to make some of the requirements of operational planning and control clearer. Uh, hierarchy of control is the same, uh, but it clarifies the idea of managing change and it clarifies the, the concepts of managing contractors as what you're trying to manage them for. Uh, outsourcing uh, is focused on all management system standards now. Um, there have been cases in the past, in my experience, where an organization has said, well, okay, we, we outsource a particular activity. Um, you know, we outsource the emptying of the drains or something like that. And they just then wash the hands of all responsibility and say, well, you know, it's a subcontractor's problem, not ours. And it's a case of here's the risks, dump them on the subcontractor and get on with it. So all the management system standards now are focusing on outsourcing, where an outsourced process is where a subcontractor or an external organization performs 
part of an organization's functional process. The organization now has to review its, what it's outsourcing and determine the, uh, the level of degree of, of control over these outsourced arrangements to make sure they're carried out properly. Um, so generally speaking, you'd find that this would be covered under the management of contractors that most organizations do pretty well. Uh, but it's worth checking whether outsourcing goes on and to the extent that your organization has thought through the risks of outsourcing these activities, the risk to the contractors themselves and the risk the contractors pose to your people when they're actually doing the outsource process. Um, emergency preparedness, yeah, it's, it's got quite a lot of stuff in it, but it's all clarifying what you, all, what you, you guys already know. Um, it's just common sense, clarifying good practice. Uh, this is where, yeah, you're trying to look at how effective the management system is. Um, so there's requirement to determine what needs to be monitored and measured, when criteria for evaluation, analysis, and covers up calibration of measuring equipment. Evaluation of legal compliance, you've all come across that before, whether it's 4801 or 18,001. There's just more blurb in 45,001 about how it needs to be done. Yes, internal audits and yes, management review. And you'll see there that management review includes changes in the internal and external issues related to context. Uh, it involves communication with interested parties. It does involve work of participation and consultation, feedback and trends. So uh, as far as your existing management systems go, monitoring and measuring is roughly the same. Legal compliance is a bit clearer. Internal audit's the same. Management review has some changes in it with regards to the aspects of the management system and the inputs that need to be considered, uh, but they're linked to the changes in the front end of the standard with clauses four and five. So that's um, a bit of a change, but it's not that big a deal. Um, clause 10 covers improvement activities. And yes, there's a requirement to investigate incidents and non-conformities, uh, review the need for corrective action, etc. continual improvement. So uh, continual improvement there requires improvement processes uh, preventing occurrence and incidents, non conformities promoting a positive culture and improving performance. So there's some, uh, a, that requirement there is, is a strengthened requirement that a lot of you will probably be able to address quite nicely, but uh, promoting a positive culture is quite an interesting one. Uh, that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of what I prepared to give you a taster of what's in this new standard and what the significant changes are. Um, a lot of that is based on my limited experience now of auditing 45,001, uh, but I'm open to taking any questions. Thank you, Andy, um, for that. That was great. Um, so. The first question um, Peter asks, is this only a theoretical review? I'm not sure, it was very at the very beginning. So um, he said, has Andy not implemented 45001? Um, I think you have, is that right? I, I, I audited. Right, okay. And the next question is from an anonymous attendee. Does risk assessment still use likelihood? Uh, Yes, yes. The, the, the method that an organization uses to assess its risks isn't changed. The, 
there's still the requirement that the organization has to decide how it's going to actually do the assessment of its risks. Uh, there's no specified method of how that risk assessment is done uh, with regards you know, using a matrix or you know, likelihoods and probabilities and things. The organization has to decide that for itself. Okay. Um, Troy asks, ISO 4511 puts leadership in the care of the system. How to evaluate leadership when conducting an audit? 45,001 puts leadership in the care of the system. I'm not, if, if, if the question relates to 45,001 uh, spelling out the re requirements for leadership to look after the system, then that makes sense. Um, how's that evaluated? Well, as an auditor, I go and interview top management and ask them questions about what they're doing to demonstrate leadership and commitment. Uh, how are they ensuring that the policy and objectives are established and rolled out? How have they ensured integration of the management of the safety management system into the business processes? How do they communicate the importance of effective safety management to the organization? So it's, it's just a case of taking 5.1 and asking them what they're doing about it. And <laughs> there are some interesting conversations I've had with top management about that, where they say, well, what do you mean by communicating the importance of OHS management? And I say, well, hang on, you're supposed to be answering that, I'm the auditor. Uh, and so, we sort of dig into are, are they cluey about their obligations and what are they doing about it uh, so it's typically by interview and then looking for actions initiatives feedback from other parts of the organization to confirm that they are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing okay thank you robin asks what is the uptake on five four five dollar one currently Oh, ah, good question. Uh, <laughs> like all the other management system standards that, that, that change, there's initially a little bit of a surge where companies want to be first ones in best dress sort of stuff. Uh, and, or, you know, going to their clients and saying, hey, we've got 45,000, well, one of the first ones. And, and after that initial small surge, there's usually a, there's, there's a quiet period where other organizations are scratching their head and thinking, mm, what are we gonna do? Because they all know we've got three years to do it. And then about the, the round about the point where there's 12 months to go before 18,001 uh, finishes, you start to get a buildup of organizations coming to uh, transition and wanting transition. Uh, my take at the moment is we're, we're still a little bit in the, in the thinking mode and getting ready mode. Uh, there'll be a, a, a more rapid uptake probably um, back end of next year or halfway through next year because 18,001 disappears in March 2021. So around about March to, to June next year, we'll start to see a pickup of a rush of people starting to drop 18,001 and, and go for 45,001 instead. Okay, so Ray asks, what is the migration timeframe for organizations currently on AS4801 certified? Right. Uh, 48, AS 4801 will still be a valid standard for the foreseeable future. So organizations who hold 4801 certification will not be required to migrate to uh, 45,001 unless they get pressure from clients or other interested parties. So 
AS4801 will remain a valid Australian standard uh, unless it's, it's withdrawn by Standards Australia. And there's no current plans to do that. The only problem there is if you've got OSHS 18001, that will expire in March 2021. So if you've only got 18001, you will have to, to transition to 45001 before March. 2021. Okay, Alan asks, what is the frequency under this new version that management must review sign off against the OHS system? Uh, there's no specified period or requirement for them to do that. Management review has to be done at planned intervals. The frequency that management review is needed to make sure the management system is adequate and effective varies enormously from company to company. If the company is going through rapid transition, acquiring new companies, changing processes, changing products, turning over staff, they may need a more frequent management review than if the organization is quite small and very, very, very stable. Okay, um, some, an anonymous person has asked, people complain safety audit has become paperwork based. Um, there is no real value for safety risk management. How do you think? So let me just clarify that. So they, the, the question is that some people are saying they don't get value from safety audits. Well, they're complaining that safety audits are basically paperwork based and there's no real value for safety risk management. Oh, oh, right. OK, well. Safety risk management is about getting results. It's about having things under control. I don't see any way that an effective auditor can evaluate whether things are under control without actually going out there and looking at the situation and verifying that, that things are safe, the environment's safe, people are working safely, because you can't tell that from just numbers and you can't tell it from records. You've, you've got to go see. Um, so I, I challenge any safety auditor who just looks at paper and records to say, nah, validate what you're seeing on paper by going out and looking at what's actually out there because paper can be different to reality. Okay, Alan asks also, what levels of management should you ensure you gain a sign off of their understanding? Ah, ooh, that's a good question. Um, the, the definition of top management is uh, personal people directing and controlling at the most senior level. Now, the, the most senior level of management will be the ones who are involved in the scope of the management system that's being considered. So for example, if you have an organization that's like a corporate organization, there's a head office somewhere, and let's say there's an operation in each state. Uh, if, if certification is sought on a state by state level, then the top management applicable would be the, the state management team. If the organization decided it was going to go for a multi-site approval, so it's going to go for a national approval, then the top management would be the senior executive team in head office, as well as the, the state management. So it does depend on the scope of the, or, uh, scope of the management system who are top management within that scope. Okay, thank you. Um, Alex asks, where is the best place to look for re resources, that is forms and templates to assist you in implementing a management system? Drafting your own documents all the time has become very time consuming. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Um, there are, hmm. excuse me, if on the internet, there's, there's quite a lot of forms and templates around. There's, there's some simple free ones and there's ones that you can opt into and purchase. Uh, but as always, it's about adapting them to your own needs. Um, 
I think the I think the thing you've got to do is look at the extent of documentation that you need uh, for your organisation. Um, my adage has always been, I'm I'm not going to be bothered writing detailed procedures if no one needs to read them. So if the context of the organisation is uh, I don't need highly detailed procedures, then I'm not going to write them. So I'd go back and look at the needs of the people and decide how much documentation I need to manage the management system to get the right results. Okay, thank you. Um, Christine asks, when auditing a 451 system, do you often see an overarching system or document or manual that sets out what a business system actually looks like? Uh, yes. Yes, there's there's a lot of a, a lot of that around. Um, there is there is no requirement in these management system standards now to have a manual or a, a management system manual as it used to be. the The problem becomes if if you're trying to induct people or give people orientation into how a management system works some sort of big picture overview to give them the the idea of what are all the functions and processes that are involved uh, and that might help them get down to more detailed stuff that's relevant to them is usually quite useful um, and it, it's something that i often see used in orientation induction programs for new employees where the management system is quite complicated if it's a very simple organization, few people, and very, very, very simple processes, they may not need to know much. It may be just a simple one page diagram, uh, but some sort of overview, it's quite, quite useful and quite a good idea. Okay, Roya asks, how likely is, does this standard work for small businesses? Ah, <laughs> well, it works just fine provided you scale down the expectations to match the needs of a small business in a small business the, the level of sophistication needed for communication is much easier than a very large organization uh, consultation can work much much more easily in a small organization uh, so the the level of sophistication you need in a management system for a small business is much much less than a, than larger ones. So the the trick there is keep your management system scaled to the needs of the business. Small business, simple system, hopefully. Sorry there, guys, I, had, I was muting myself. Um, Peter asks, apart from a good look, what is the business case for putting in 45001 to an organisation that does none of the ISO standards? Wow, that, that is an excellent, excellent question. Um, okay, so the, I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the environment that the organization works in and its customers and clientele, uh, if those customers and clientele value a, a safe subcontractor, somebody who's not going to have accidents if they come and do work for them, etc., then you're probably going to score bonus points and you'll probably need it to impress new customers. Uh, a lot of um, tender evaluation now is related to have you got a safety management system what's your safety performance like so it may be a case of you need it to get on a bid list um, you also may want it that you know it's, it's an excellent way of due diligence and due, addressing duty of care requirements and addressing your legal obligations um, it's it, it's difficult in many ways 
to make sure you're addressing all your legal obligations correctly if you don't have a systematic way of doing it. And 45,001 provides a model to address something in a systematic way. It just, it needs proper application to the organization to make sure it fits properly. Okay, well, on that note also, we, my as an organization has um, 27,001 to ensure data safety. And, yeah. and that became a, a requirement from many of our tenders and, and customers to make sure that their safety data was safe. Um, Okay, so next one, um, Anonymous asks, is ISO 451 implementation mandatory or optional for organizations? Oh, it's, it's purely optional. Now, the only, the only difference with that is uh, if, you've, if you've accepted a contract which obliges you to have a safety management system of 45,001 or 18,001, then of course it's it's a contractual obligation uh, but otherwise it's it's largely optional uh, and that's that's why i was saying earlier that as4801 will remain a valid management system standard for the foreseeable future because there's a number of regulatory bodies uh, and government agencies who will still recognize AS4801 certification as a valid safety management system standard. Thank you. Um, Jason asks, how can we manage the outsourced product service in the risk management hierarchy? There is a substitution to remove the risk by outsourcing it, but we are still responsible for the risk. Yes. Um, it, I, I believe under Australian law that uh, where you're engaging contractors, uh, there's a joint obligation for safety of the contractors when they're working under your direction. Uh, so that, that's going to cover off outsourcing. Um, if, if an organisation is going to outsource, I like working at heights, for instance, um, you know, all our work in at height is going to be done by an outsourced organization. Fine, but there's still that obligation to make sure that they, they are doing safe things and, and that your management of contractors, you know, you're making sure that they've, they have got the licenses and they, they have got some sort of risk assessment in place to cover the work they're going to do for you. Shane asks, um, by the way, um, Andy, just let me know when you're, because we're getting close to the hour now, just yeah. let me know. There's a, there's around, um, well, lots more questions. <laughs> just, okay. they can also email you questions afterwards. Oh yes. Yes, of course. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just let me know. Um, I think we should probably t turn off in a couple of minutes. So okay. um, Sh Shane asks if, if a company has both 4801 and 18, 18,001, I think you mean, yeah. and, and they need to transition to 451. Is there any benefit from maintaining 4801? Um, oh, good question. Um, only if some of your clients require 4801. Uh, if there's no client demand specifically for 4801, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be any benefiting in hanging on to it. Uh, if you've, if you've, there are you know, slight differences between 4801 and 45,001, but I don't think if you've got 45,001, there'd be any additional cost to retaining 4801 other than perhaps some additional cost for extra certificates, extra accreditation. But I don't think there'd be significant audit duration that would cost significant amounts of money to keep it. Okay, Clarence asks, since um, 4801 will not be replaced by 4501, would the former be revised as it is already more than 18 years old? <laughs> wow. Um, that's probably a question for Standards Australia rather than me. Uh, however, as, as it's a well-established, well-recognised standard, and, and most people recognise that yeah, it, it, it works pretty well. 
for what it does. If regulators continue to accept 4801 as a valid management system standard, it's, it's unlikely to be significantly revised and updated because the market for it is going to be so much smaller now that 45,000 are on the scene. Okay, uh, the next question's quite interesting. Would, Roy asks, would you recommend using safety software facilitating for implementing 45001? Run that through me again. Would I would recommend you, safety software? <laughs> would you recommend using safety software for implementing 45001? I, I do know we have a, a, you can create your own inspections and audits and we, we actually have an audit like that, but um, I think it's, 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 it's not. Um, yeah, I mean, and you, you can, there's various software tools kicking around for, uh, uh, as you say, Sarah, for, you yeah, know, creating and managing an audit program for incident investigation and reporting. Uh, there's there's uh, sorts of spreadsheets kicking around for risk assessments and stuff. Um, I'm, I can't say as I've ever come across something that takes you through the design and development of a management system. Uh, more the software I see is for running it, you know, think, separate functions like document control, like in investigations and corrective action management, et cetera. Okay, I think we'll just have one more. Um, I have, it's a long one, so I haven't really read it. Um, Larry asked, should organizations have a single, quote, whole of company, quote, approach that then covers all business units under a common umbrella so that un under a risk review, a single approach taken to mitigate the risks so that the top management man manages a single approach with specific requirements and an individual business unit requires. And maybe that's a bit hard. Um, right. I, I think, well, I think the short answer to that is depending on the organization and the degree of management managerial control, there are some organizations that have multiple operations kicking around the country where the hazards and risks at individual sites are significantly different where the equipment at the sites is different and the operational requirements for the sites are different. so to that extent there's a degree of uh, difference required in the management system for each of those sites can you have a, a management system overview then that that manages uh, an, OHS of, uh, uh, an OHS review and management system that's the umbrella for the sites? Yes, you can. And that should be applied if management are interested in keeping an eye on all the sites in the, um, in the empire. Okay, Andy, there are just a couple more interesting ones. So I'll just do those two and then that's it, I promise. Am I allowed to phone a friend for some of these interesting ones? <laughs> Yes, you can. <laughs> All right, you, you can find the answer out later. Um, Clarence says, are there common challenges, problems when organisations migrate from 4801 to 45001? Uh, yeah, the, the common challenges are having somebody in the organisation take the time to read 45001 and try and apply it. That's the big problem, uh, finding the time to do that. Uh, the second one is briefing management on, on these new expectations because more often than not the analysis of context and interested parties and targets and objectives and strategic direction that's the domain of top management and they may not have been perhaps as heavily engaged with this stuff in the past that they'll need to be for 45,001. So briefing management and bringing them up to speed so that they can handle these questions and demonstrate they're doing something can be quite a challenge. But it can be improved by telling them that the audit is coming and they'll have to have some answers. Okay, last question, and I promise this. Is it likely that Commonwealth and local government will adopt 45001? <laughs> Would you like to ask Mr. Morrison that one? <laughs> 
I, I, I have no idea. I don't have any contacts with those sort of uh, environments uh, by choice. Um, I, I really don't know. They're, they're uh, at their own whim. And that's one of the aspects of uh, you know, context analysis, changes in, in the political landscape that I have no idea. Okay, well, would it be likely to be based on tenders and, and that sort of thing that they might yeah. have to face? Yeah, if, if there's a change, it'll come through the regulators. Um, each regulator will have to think out what it wants itself, but on the basis that 45,001 is bringing in more strategic direction and strategic management for OHS rather than the day-to-day -day operational stuff that that 18,148.01 does. If regulators want top management to have a strategic involvement in management systems that relate to what the regulators are interested in, they'll go for 45,001. If regulators are, are really focused on making sure that risks at operational level are under effective control, they'll quite likely stick with 4801. Okay, thank you, Andy. The, the other few questions I'll send to you because I think sure. overall they're probably interesting for you to maybe answer in an article as well. So, sure. okay. um, all right. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming and remind you that we'll send a video that'll take a day or two. Um, there's going to an email will go out very shortly with um, Andy's email address so you can bombard him some more. And... Um, and there's a webinar next week on uh, uh, safety differently in OSH professionals. Um, so that's next Wednesday, I think. Um, and I'll send the link to that too. So thank you, Andy. Um, okay. And hopefully we'll see you again sometime. All right. So everybody stay cool and have a safe and Merry Christmas. Thanks for <laughs> participating and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. MyOSH is a cloud-based workplace health and safety platform that works with you and your team to improve workplace health, safety, and quality. Over 50 configurable models integrate to collect HSEQ data. Modules are used to manage hazards, investigate incidents, manage risk, conduct audits, and much more. Our mobile app is used for fast data capture in the field, online or offline. Features include QR code scanning, digital signatures, geolocations, and geofencing, PDF export, and much more. You can configure mobile forms, visibility, and functionality in your administration panel. The MyOSH dashboard provides powerful organizational insight by transforming your HSEQ data into intelligent visual charts, maps, and tables. Up-to-date data is derived from modules and displayed in an interactive visual format configured specifically for you and your team. MyOSH is built on the Viking Pass, a super configurable platform with powerful capabilities. Teams can quickly and easily configure the platform to their own very unique end-to-end -end process requirements. We encourage you to treat your software technology like a team member. The MyOSH Academy is designed to empower your team with the skills to ensure they use their software tools productively. Everyone learns differently, so the Academy holds a variety of resources including videos, guided learning, and verified online learning courses for each MyOSH module. Your investment in MyOSH helps you and your team manage risk, compliance, and improve workplace health and safety. Today, successful organizations view safety as an asset and health and safety spending as an investment. This is because a safe workplace adds measurable business value and can drive tangible improvements in performance, profit, and culture. Ask our team for an online demonstration today.